All right, so Engineering Basics 13. Uh, we're basically just going to continue with what we did last time. Um, so just be more, more moment of inertia stuff. Um, so continuing with what we did last time, uh, I still want to review the, the, the topics a little bit because I know they're kind of confusing. So uh, can either of you guys give me a good a good solid definition without using any math of what the center of mass is. It's the average location of all of the mass in an object. Okay. That's a good definition. And then... So we can like estimate all the mass as being in one point. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. So, then can you guys tell me what the first moment is? I always forget the first moment. So the best way to think about the first moment. Oh, did you? Did you were you going to try and answer? <laughs> well, I pulled out my notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> According to my notes, it's the average distance that everything is from the center. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. It's the so the, the first moment, Q, is the sum of the distances divided by the total amount of stuff. So the distance that the said stuff is away divided by the total amount of stuff. So it kind of gives you an idea of the average distance that everything is away, which in turn is why it's called the first moment, right? Because a, a moment, just calling something a moment or a moment arm, refers to a distance away from something that you would start to rotate in. So the first moment tells us that. I'm going to come back to this slide in a second. Um, the moment of inertia tells us the average location of the moments. So that's why it's sometimes called the second moment. So where, where the full first moment gives you the sum of... Um, the sum of the the distances times the amount of stuff normalized over the amount of stuff, the moment of inertia doesn't normalize. So if we have a, a teeny tiny pencil versus a, a big, I don't know, like a building, uh, the moment of inertia will be different. You could have a first moment for a building and a pencil that are both equal to zero if, uh, if your moment, right, if you're, if you're building is centered right on that x-axis and your pencil is also centered right on that x-axis uh, pretend that's a pencil and these would actually have in the um in the x direction right in the x direction they would have exactly the same first moment but their moment of inertia is not normalized so they would have very very different moments of inertia so our moment of inertia definition, and we'll say this is in the x direction, is the y distance times the amount of stuff there, again, times the distance. So we have the moment times the distance away it is from the center. And then that simplifies to y squared dA, or dm, doesn't matter, just whether if you're in two dimensions, we say dA. If you're in three dimensions or you're talking about something with different densities, then we would say dm. Um, so the uh, where we left off last time was we were trying to derive this for some different shapes. Uh, and I messed up the derivation, but I've got it now. Um, so uh, I'll, I'm going to still follow this philosophy, the, the idea of reduction using taking a complex idea and reducing it to a number. So that's what we're doing here, right? We take this complex idea, well, about how much stuff is there and how far away from whatever whatever axis we care about is it, and we're going to call that the moment of inertia. So this is what where we were last time. We had uh, a slender rod that's 10 inches long and uh, has a negligible radius, and what we're saying, uh, why did I have a 30 here? 
we're gonna we're gonna erase this 30 because I don't know why it's there. That should be a 10. Um, so last time we had uh, we had this length, this rod we're gonna say has some mass, some mass m. We'll call it five pounds. Um, and we're trying to figure out well how do we use this equation that we now have to describe it um, to figure out what this is? Um, some smart people in the past have figured out have figured this out for a bunch of little a bunch of shapes for us already. But um, if we encounter any funky shapes or we want to we want to get a, an idea of what we need to do to our designs to reduce their moment, um, then this is a, a good way to go about it. So. First of all, let's just ditch all of this. We're going to start over on the next page. We're going to start over here. Okay, so let's just redraw the problem. So I've got an axis there. I've got an axis here. And I've got an axis there. I'm going to call this my x-axis, call this the z-axis, we'll call that one the y-axis. Then I'll draw my, uh, draw my slender rod here. Oh. Let's go ahead and make that a skinny rod. There we go. Okay, so now we have our rod that's total length is 10 inches. The mass, M equals 5 pounds. And what we want to find is the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So, um, let's start with our known equation. So we have this equation, ixx equals the integral of y squared. And remember, y here is because that's the distance away that we're going from the x-axis. So y squared dm. And we're going to use mass because that's what we're given. So uh, last time, we were trying to figure out Okay, how do we how do we actually take this equation, um, this equation that we're given, and turn it into something useful? Um, so what we need to do is figure out what each little differential slice of this thing is, what the mass of each of those are. So we're gonna say this is at distance y, um, and then our our little slice is gonna look like this, and it's got radius radius effectively zero but we'll say approximately zero um and we want to figure out what is the mass of that little slice um so one way one way to think about this is well the total mass of this thing total mass m uh, i'm just going to call that big m for now so i'm going to replace a variable so uh, for, every, for every little extra bit that we add on, uh, we're going to assume, if we assume it's uniform density, then that means the mass is proportional to the length. So we can say m over l equals 5 pounds. Um, in other words, the mass, the little mass, is equal to 5 pounds for every 10 inches, right? Uh, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it this way. We're gonna say five pounds over 10 inches would be, um, this might be something you'd see in a distributed load, uh, but this is essentially like our, our density. 
effectively, right? Um, and some uh, a lot of times in physics or in stuff like this, you'll see um, mass is a function of density and of geometry. So because our geometry always stays the same, it's just a matter of density. So that's saying, right, if I, if I were to cut this thing down to five inches, then it would be only two and a half pounds. If I were to cut it down to three inches, if I were to cut down to three inches, then that would be, what, 30%? So uh, will that be 1.6 pounds? No. Uh, 10% is, is half a pound. 1.5 pounds, there we go. So, that means, um, that means that for every, uh, we, we can pull this out to there, and say the mass equals five pounds times the distance, or lowercase m, lowercase m, which we're gonna use here, is equal to, or well, not say equals, say m is equal to five y. So that's the total mass, total mass, big M, and then y will change as our length, uh, as our length increases. So now we have all the tools that we need in order to in order to solve this. So this is equivalent to integral from negative 5 to 5 of y squared. And if we're taking the derivative of this, right, the derivative of y is just 1. 1. So dm equals 5. So it'd be y squared times 5. Um, and actually, let's do, I'm going to make this 7 pounds, just so that it's a little clearer to see what numbers are what. We're going to make that 7 pounds, 7 pounds, 7 pounds. Okay, so now we have a function in terms of y, um, just a discrete integral. Um, I think most of you, have, have you guys both been through uh, Calc 1 and Calc 2? Yeah. Yes. At least between high school and, and, yeah. and this year. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is all pretty familiar for us, right? We just turn this into, this would be y cubed over 3 times 7 uh, evaluated from minus 5 to 5. Um, and one, one way that we can rewrite this is since we're going from negative 5 to 5, well, we could say that's equivalent to y cubed over 3 times 7 evaluated from 10 over 2, or from negative 10 over 2 to 10 over 2. Um, and the reason, we, the reason for doing that is I want to get it into a certain form. So let's duplicate this. So we've got i, x, x. Oh, I'm okay. going to go back to black here. You have a question? I'm a little bit confused. Where did the seven come from again? Uh, so, so here I said it weighs five pounds. Uh -huh. um, I'm just oh, going to change it. Seven? Yeah, I'm just changing the problem to seven, just so it's a little easier uh, to see okay, which okay. numbers correspond to what. Um, uh, okay, yeah. And th this is purely just so that we can see uh, in this derivation. Like, we can line up which five belongs to what. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just missed that part. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> no problem. All right, so I'll just rewrite at the top here. We have I x x equals y cubed over three times seven times ten over two, or times negative ten over two to ten over two. Um, so we can rewrite this as ten over two cubed over 3, 7 times 10 over 2 cubed over 3, minus 10 over 2 cubed over 3. 
And what this will do is this means that we actually, uh, we can rewrite this as seven times 10 cubed over two cubed times three minus 10 cubed over, oh, sorry, that should be plus, right? Because we're subtracting a negative. Well, I guess that one would stay. So that becomes 10 plus 10 times 2 cubed times 3. And then if we go back to our definition here, right, we ended up solving for, um, for little m, but we need to divide this by big M at the end. So the mass here really is not just 7. It's 7 over, uh, over 10. So uh, let's see. What's a, what's a good way to, to analog this? That should be 7 over 10. Hmm. Well, we're close. We're close. I'm still messing something up. We've got seven. Well, this would be one twelfth times ten over two. Well, it'd be times 10 cubed. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's what it is. We've got 10 cubed over 2. So what I'm going to do is pull this. Uh, I'm pulling, so 2 squared times 3 is equal to 12. So I'm just going to pull this 1 12th out. This is going to be times 2, because there's two of them. 1, 2 times 7. Um, and over here, uh, this, this dividing by 10 at the start is because we actually want this density to be normalized over the whole length. So um, we've got 5 pounds per 10 inches times inches will give us a, a mass. So that was my, that was my bad at the start. Um, so this should really be 7 over 10, and this will be 7 over 10. So the mass is 7. Here, right, we've got 5 pounds over 10 inches. Multiply by inches, and we're here. So this should have been 7 over 10. This should have been 7 over 10. This should have been 7 over 10. And I, I can, I can rewalk through it uh, if you guys didn't follow. I think I get what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got this. So our twos cancel. One of the tens cancels. And we're left with 1 twelfth times 10 squared times 7, which, if we look at our charts, is now in the same form as the equation that's on our chart. Um, so the equation that I gave last time, eh, we'll, just, we'll just start here equation that I, I said last time, oh, well, we should end up here, was Ixx for a slender rod is 1 12th total mass times the total length squared. And that is the same thing that we have down here. We have 1 12th 
times the total mass, which is 7, times the total length squared, which is 10. And for completion's sake, let's see, what is that? That's going to be 700 over 12, 58.3. That's 58.3, and this is in units of pounds times inches squared. So, pound inches squared. So, that's, uh, that's how you do it for Slender Rod. Uh, this is, I'm sure, right now, kind of a meaningless number. But we could, we could imagine, right, if our rod is heavier, let's say instead of being a steel rod, it's now a lead rod. Well, this is going to go up about the same amount that it's heavier, right? If lead is, let's see, what is lead? Uh, 63. And then iron is 25. So we would expect it to be a little like 2.1, 2.2 times heavier, which means that the moment of inertia would be about 2.1, 2.2 times higher. Um, similarly, if we increase the length of our rod, um, for every uh, for every inch that we include, right, we're getting farther away. But on both sides of our, um, we're getting farther. We're putting more of our mass farther away from the the line, the the axis that we're rotating around here. Um, so it makes sense that it'll have kind of more of an effect than just increasing the mass. So if we make this thing longer, um, then that'll that'll end up with this this kind of squaring effect. So um, one way that we can look at this, one way that we can kind of compare, is to just look visually. So I'm gonna go ahead and change. Let's see, and I'm going to want to switch you guys to that one. Yeah, there we go. So here's uh, last time we, we had this point mass. So what we're trying to do is figure out how much effort or how what is the resistance that we're going to have to this rotating about the x-axis. And if we go ahead and change to the slender rod here, um, and we'll have the effort trying to rotate this thing about this axis now. And uh, I'm, this is a lot easier to tell when you actually have stuff in your hands. So if you've got a long rod, um, you could even do this with a pencil, right? You, you put a pencil, um, try, and, try and rotate a pencil. Now, if you, if you have something that's really light and you put a big mass on the end, that'll be a lot harder to rotate um, than your pencil. But if you have just the pencil by itself versus, I don't know, some little, uh, uh, these, these way close enough to the same, this little eraser and this pencil. Well, this thing to try and rotate this thing, if I had a string, um, you, you can, you can totally do this with a string. Just, just have it like a pendulum. Um, you can actually feel that it's, it's a lot easier to rotate that mass on the end of a string than it is the, the whole solid bar. So, that's our slender rod. Uh, so uh, the next thing we could do is say, well, what is the what is the moment of inertia for our slender rod here in a different axis? So right now I'm trying to rotate around the the x axis. Um, what would you guys predict it would be if I'm now trying to rotate around the y axis? So in this view, it's the the axis that goes straight up. You guys have any thoughts? I would think it would be the same. Okay, and why, why do you think it would be the same? You're rotating about the same point, and the length on both sides would be the same. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. That's, that's the perfect way to think about it. So we're, even though our axis is different, right, even though we're, oh, come on, Saldrix. Even though we're rotating about a different axis, fundamentally, we're doing the same thing, right? I could just look at it this way, and oh, look, now it looks like a y-axis. 
Um, so for all intents and purposes, right, that's the same thing. Now, what if I were to try and rotate about the z-axis? What do you guys think about trying to rotate about this axis? It would definitely be different, I would say. Do you think it would be bigger or smaller? Uh, smaller, because your radius is a lot less. Right, that's exactly perfect. So for the, the perfect slender rod of science, um, this would actually be zero. Because um, what, what we said is our radius in that direction is zero. So even though we have the exact same mass in three different directions, we could have potentially different moments of inertia. Um, and this is just depending on our reference frame. So right now we're saying we're looking in the z-axis. So we're saying this body, when we're trying to rotate it about this axis, it's going to be a lot easier to spin. And that's why we have stuff like drive shafts, right? Drive shafts are these long, skinny, these long, skinny things. So because their axis is really small, we can spin them really quickly, really easily. Um, and that we can make them really long, and it doesn't really affect how hard they are to spin. It adds a little bit of mass just because we have more stuff. But right, the smaller we can get those shafts, the the less energy we waste just spinning the shaft, and we can put more energy into whatever useful thing we want to do. So on the Baja car, right, we want to spin the wheels. We want to make the car go forward. We don't actually care about all of the stuff in the powertrain. Except uh, maybe a wheel speed sensor, but that's not even spinning. So that's for the slender rod. Um, so just to reiterate, um, let's get back here. So just to reiterate, what we did is we took we took the we went from our our given equation here. This is our our general equation. General equation. We said, okay, um, I have. I'm, I'm going to solve for dm in terms of y. That way, I uh, I can do an integral. Same same as you would do an integral in any math class, right? You want to solve for whatever your last thing is. Or I could I could have called this da and said that every little circle has some certain little mass. The equation that I'm using here, I'm saying, okay, this thing is of uniform density. So its density is 5 pounds per every 10 inches. And the derivative of mass is a density. It's the your, your, your mass per unit length. So, right, I take the derivative of both sides. This would be m equals 5 over 10. And then if times y times the length, dm, dy, y comes out there, and then we plug it in here. So if I were if I were really being uh, if I were really being precise, I would slap a little dy on the end, and I guess that could be a that that should be a seven for for the sake of continuity. There we go. There we go. So, um, let's try something a little more complex. Uh, and actually, before we get to that, let's let's go through a little mental exercise. I'm going to go back to uh, back to SolidWorks here. Um, let's see. Is that the one? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so back to SolidWorks here. Back to my X moment. Um, and I just I just made some primitive shapes. So just some simple shapes. Um, these are things that you'd probably like work out in a class. Kind of like how we derived for the slender rod. Um, if you're interested in the, the derivations of these, uh, if you're if you're beyond just looking at a chart, um, then I think just trying to figure it out for for these simple shapes is probably good enough. Um, if you're interested in more than that, then uh, 
I would suggest looking at uh, Hyperphysics is a pretty good website. Um, they have a, a nice page on the moment of inertia. Um, and also YouTube is just chock full of derivations of moments of inertia. So um, we started off with the point mass. So we said, okay, this point mass is going to have uh, the, the lowest of all of our primitive shapes. It's going to have the lowest um, moment of inertia. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to refer to everything in the, in the x-axis for just for a second. So about the x-axis, right, we just have all of it is located at one radius. And the closer we get that, that point mass to the middle, the, um, the lower our moment of inertia is going to be. I, I guess I said that in the opposite. Uh, the opposite way so if we just have one point then the farther out it is it means it'll be bigger as compared to something where it where you're actually spread out over your radius so start with the point mass then we move to the slender rod and we said okay so we took that mass that was at the end and we just spread it out over a line and and this line, it'll actually have lower of a, um, it'll have lower, it'll have a lower moment of inertia, right? It's one twelfth lower, so the it's actually reduced by a significant, or not one twelfth lower, it's one twelfth as much as the point mass. Um, so because we spread all this mass out over this over this section, um, it's now going to be a lot easier for us to to spin it than if it was just that mass at the end so going from a slender rod what if we have a bar so we'll still say this is the same mass that same seven pounds but now um now there's actually some area here that we have to think about so rather than rather than being negligible uh we now have some area that we have to consider. So, what do you guys, how do you guys think that the bar would compare to the slender rod? Uh, just relatively speaking. Any thoughts there? First of all, do you guys think it would have a higher moment of inertia, or do you think it would have a lower moment of inertia than the slender rod? I would guess higher. And why? Um, no, no. I mean, I just... Um, it feels more unwieldy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that... Honestly, that's a, a good way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so... If you say it feels more unwieldy, uh, yeah. can you can you describe that a little more? What about it seems like? Why would you think that it would be more unwieldy? Like there's more stuff spread out over more area that you're trying to rotate. Yeah, like, that's that's exactly right. So um, if we go along with the uh, and I can actually go ahead and show. Um, can I show that axis? Oh, I didn't put one in there. So if we look at this compared to the slender rod, right? The slender rod, everything was just along one fine line um, here. Maybe I can I'll show the, the z-axis really quick. So everything is a, uh, with the slender rod is all located right next to that line. Um, so here, what we're doing is, well, we've got, we just have some triangles to contend with. So instead of everything being right on this line, we've now spread it out away from this line. We know the hypotenuse, right? The hypotenuse has to be, um, has to be longer than our original length. So as we spread out, um, just for like, if we just took that one little circle, we beefed it up, it's now a bigger circle. But we've now taken what was let's say two inches away and now we've made it two root three inches away right on the outside and and right in the center it would be the same but as we go farther out then we're actually getting farther and farther away from this axis that we're actually rotating around so um it would 
it would make sense that since we're get since we're putting more of our mass farther away from that axis that it'll be harder to turn um and and like like you said right if you were to if you were to have like a i don't know like a yoga mat um a yoga mat you you try to spin a yoga mat around your hand Let, let's assume you have rubber bands on it right you know you can do it it's it's a yoga mat it's not that heavy but if you were to take like a, a piece of rebar um I, I would say that would be close-ish to the same weight. Maybe not maybe not rebar, but like a like a steel rod or something. Something that's the same length and the same weight. Um it'll be a lot easier to spin that around your arm. Or you could even spin that around your finger, right? Uh and you can it's easier to spin it, it's easier to keep it spinning. And that's because Mo more of that mass is located closer to the center of that axis, which means more of it is located closer to the axis that we're actually trying to spin around. So, um, one of the nice things with a bar is that uh, in just like the... I'm going to hide this again just so we don't come back to it. Um, so, our because we have some, some different planes of symmetry here... Um, the, the rotation in this axis is going to look exactly the same as our rotation in this axis. Let's go ahead and make this the bar. I'm going to apply that to every configuration. So, right, those look exactly the same. It's just a matter of the angle that we look at it, right? So, fundamentally, right, all of our stuff is still that same. Like, it's on a, it's on a cone or you could think of it as, as like existing a, the same distance away from the, the place that we're, um, from the axis that we're concerned with. So now, uh, now, how about the Z axis? What do you guys think? So um, before, when we had the slender rod, we had the slender rod. We said the the moment of inertia for like the perfect slender rod of science about the z-axis would be zero, right? Because all of our all of our mass is located right next to the axis, and and for the perfect one, right on it. So for a bar, what do you guys think? It's going to be much larger, right? Because a lot of the mass is yeah, and I mean. Away. And technically, it would be infinitely larger, right? Because it there there is mass located not right next to the axis. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, one of the one of the cool things here is that uh, it's uh, when you have a circle, uh, when you have something that is has a circular profile, um, your your moment of inertia becomes just a, a factor of the radius um so if we go back here and i'm back on the presentation yeah so let's let's go ahead and make a new page here um if we have something that is uh that we're trying to rotate um this could be that bar or you could think of this as like a gear right a gear is you know roughly a circle it's got some little extra bits on it, but for the most part, it's a circle. Um, all that making this circle thicker does is just in just add more mass. Um, as long as our uh, as long as we have that same shape repeated throughout this, uh, like that same outline, the, the cross section is the same throughout. All that making it longer does is increase the mass. So. Now we can do the same thing. We say, okay, um, this is our our distance from the center. Uh, we say that our total mass, our total mass over total length, we'll call that equal to 7 over 10, so 7 pounds over 10 inches. So we say I gonna call this i uh sure why not we'll call this z that way it matches the the solidworks thing so i z z equals the integral 
of r squared dA. Um, and this is something that we actually uh, we actually can solve dA pretty easily, right? dA, the derivative of a circle, we have pi r squared. Derivative of that is 2 pi r. And since we care about the mass, or we care about the area of this thing, we can replace this uh this uh this what would i call this this coefficient here we say that r squared da equals the sum of r squared dm and because we're talking about like we measured this thing beforehand we know that it's 10 inches well now i don't actually care about what the uh I don't actually care about that coefficient because it came out in my measurement. So if we're going by mass alone, then this means all we need to do is write this out like we did before um, with the slender rod. So now we'll have the total mass. However, the total mass, or our, our distance away, is not going to change for every single cross-section. So this ends up being um, r cubed over 3. Oh, not over 3. We've got a an r there. So r moves to the inside. So this ends up becoming the integral of r times big M over L from L over 2. Sorry, from minus L over 2 to L over 2. And I'm just running through this quickly. Um, that ends up being R squared over 2 from L over 2 to L over 2. Or even from 0 to L. Typically, when you, when you have a bar, you, you do it from 0 to L. Oh, that was more than I wanted to erase. 0 to L equals R squared over 2 from 0 to L. That whole thing times the mass equals L times M times R squared over 2. So that is how we end up with the moment of inertia for a cylindrical bar or a disk. Um, that, that has some uniform density, uh, some uniform cross-section. Oh, and then we said this was Z Z. I is easy. And yes, that was really hand-wavy, and I apologize, but there's a couple more things I want to get to uh, before we're done here. So, back to, back to here. So... We now have, uh, we can use our calculus skills and we can plug stuff in. Um, and I think that's the, the end of our plugging stuff in. I don't want to do it anymore. So from now on, whenever we talk about moment of inertia, we're going to reference our handy dandy sheet that we're given. Um, we'll look up the equation online or uh, one cool thing about most CAD software is because it's all geometry based, right? We All we need to know for the... Um, all we need to know to calculate the moment of inertia is just how our thing is shaped and what its density is. Um, so if I open up this part, I can just evaluate directly what the what the uh, the uh, moments of inertia are. So here we can see exactly that in the y direction. Moment of inertia is 9.714327, et cetera, et cetera. X direction is 0.56, whatever. Um, and you can kind of see that, right? So the X direction or the, the rotation, um, let's see, what are they calling their principal axes? 
I'm just curious if you are showing us the correct thing, because on my screen right now, it's just the, the slide with the dominoes. Oh, whoops, my bad. I forgot to switch it. No worries. Just making sure. There we go. My bad. Yeah, so in, in SolidWorks, uh, if you go, normally you start here, if you go to Evaluate and then Mass Properties, then that'll tell you both how much it weighs and also what its density is. Um, but it will also tell you the moments of inertia. Um, so I put this thing at the origin uh, just to make it easy so these numbers would line up. But this will this will come out exactly with what we worked out. So the moment of inertia rotating about the x-axis is, we'll call it 9.7, rotating about the y-axis, right? That's, that's functionally doing the same thing. We're just looking at it differently. Also 9.7, yet, yeah, and we see these two numbers are, are identical. And then the z-axis is that, that uh, much smaller number. So this is 0.567. And if we, in fact, if we go to the slender rod, then that should be even closer to zero. Um, so these are smaller just because I didn't update the mass. But now we can see that this is orders of magnitude smaller. So this would be... 0 0.02, this is 0 .000, 000, 000. so that's 10,000 times smaller. So in in most engineering contexts, or contexts, we would say, yep, that's basically zero. So uh, I'm done doing derivations. You can see it's definitely something you have to think about. That's why I stumble over them all the time. Um, but uh, let's go back to our assembly here. Um, now that we can think about, okay, we've, we, we added kind of one dimension here. Um, now let's think about something that isn't, uh, that doesn't have as much symmetry. So now we've got a, uh, a bar. Now we've got this rectangle. Um, I'm going to start in the x, just so we have something to compare to. So in the x-axis, um, we now have, we're now rotating it this way. Um, so about the x-axis, we're going to have some, uh, some moment of inertia. And in fact, if we go back to the part, we can just, it'll tell us what it is. So in the x-axis here, x-axis that's 43.5 is our our moment of inertia in the x-axis so we can say okay that's 43.5 that means if i want to rotate about the y-axis if i want to rotate about this one um how do you guys think it will uh what do you guys think will be the moment of inertia about the that y-axis i think it'll be bigger smaller or do you think it'd be the same I would say smaller, because it can be more slender shapes, kind of. Okay. You think it's going to be slender? Uh, was that Jacob or Gabe? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Gabe, what do you think? Do you think it would be smaller, I, bigger? I also think it would be smaller, because the, the distance of most of the masses is closer to that axis. Unless, wait... Which direction? Wait, which direction are we rotating this around? Yeah. Again? I'm... So currently, we're rotating about the the x axis, uh -huh. doing this rotation. Rotation. Next time, or here in a second, and I can just show you guys this. We're rotating about the y axis, so we're doing this. You want me to go back to the x one? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think it would be less because more of the mass is in line with the axis. In line with the axis. I'm inclined to believe you, and we'll let we'll let SolidWorks tell us here in a second. Um, but yeah, like that totally makes sense, right? We could we could look at this, and I'm using simple shapes so that uh, it's, it's there's one less dimension to think about. But yeah, right. If we if we look on this in this plane, and this is why I left the planes on there, right? The shape that exists in that plane. Um, let me go ahead and show. Oh, 
I didn't do a sketch there. Um, but if I were to do a um, a cut view, let's do it on the top plane, right? Everything will look it'll it ev everything looks the same as that cross section. So it just becomes the thickness of that cross section um, that is going to increase our mass. But this cross section definitely looks uh it's more slender it's skinnier than now this cross section let's do that plane oh i want that plane come on give me the right plane there we go yeah so now we're now we're trying to rotate this this big old thing and we've because we have a bigger dimension here right that makes our triangles bigger that makes that pushes stuff out away from that axis so yeah you guys are exactly right so i'm gonna hide that again and now the z-axis so now we're rotating about this axis what do you guys think you think it's bigger smaller or the same I think it's even smaller for the same reasoning because even more of the mass in that direction is like along the, uh, the so, axis. So, well, we did make it a lot thicker though. Do you think that'll make more of a difference or less of a difference? Mm. Not sure. So, let's look back. Let's look back at at the. Uh, the slide here and we'll we'll do this next time uh, actually that'll be a good a good thing to talk about next time anyway um but uh i mean we could we could even do it right here Let, let's calculate for the the standard domino so we're we're rotating about that axis so that would mean that we'll call it i z z equals the integral of the distance away from that axis. So we'll call that, I don't know, we'll call that y. We've got the distance away from that axis times the differential area, which in this case is just a line. Um, and we've got this distance squared and our differential area is that line times the length. So this becomes a, this is a, a squared, this is a, on the order of magnitude of a squared value. And this one is on the order of magnitude of just a, a linear value. So even though we're making this thing a lot longer, right? Even though we're kind of squishing the mass around, the shape that it takes is has a much more dramatic effect on the moment of inertia because of this this squaring concept. Um, that I mean, you could you could look at a, a graph, right? At at the beginning, you've got your parabola, right? So down here, they're about the same. About the same um, but as soon as you hit one right that's where that's where y equals x and y equals x squared intersect after that these start to get dramatically farther apart um, so generally speaking the more you separate something the farther away you push it from that axis the more your uh, the more your molar inertia is going to increase uh, one of the ways, uh, one of the things that we actually consider with the prop shaft is um, a matter of diameter versus material choice. And this is directly related to, to this effect. So, you know, I could have, I could have a, a piece of, I mean, a piece of PVC pipe, right? I have a piece of PVC pipe that's, let's say four inches, four inches in diameter. And the, uh, the amount of shear, so the force that's trying to separate the, uh, the pipe kind of along that circle, right? When we, when, we, uh, when we put it in torsion. 
So if we're we're trying to rotate one side this way and we're trying to rotate the other side that way, we're gonna get a little a little shear force in there. So that shear force is what's going to try and separate our material. So by increasing the radius here, we can now use a much, much weaker material. Uh, and that'll result in a large radius. But what we could also do is use a stronger material um, with not much of an effect on the radius. So I might go from, for example, I might go from, um, uh, I don't know, we'll say 7 sixteenths. Might go from a radius of 7 sixteenths, or uh, I, guess, I guess in this instance it would be a diameter, to a diameter of half inch, which would be 8 sixteenths. And uh, it'll make a, a much bigger difference than it would just changing the material. Um, I can show this next time with examples. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually pull up the prop shaft calculator for that uh, and, and, and show you guys. But uh, that is all I really wanted to do today. Um, uh, actually, yeah, I'll I'll show you this slide real quick. We've we've still got a couple minutes. You guys, you guys have a couple minutes. Yeah, and if it's about a torque limiter, that would be uh, pretty helpful. Yeah. So, um, this is CAD of the torque limiter. Um, all of the shapes inside here are very approximate. So, and I did not apply any material. So these numbers are meaningless. But uh, the the ratio. Excuse me, the ratios are actually pretty close. Um, so the torque limiter, uh, and I'll actually go ahead and open this up in SolidWorks so we can really look at it. Um, oh, I want that one. Right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and open... Oh, let's open this up in SolidWorks. Oh, come on, where was it? Did I not save it? Oh, maybe I didn't save it. Okay, well, I'll uh we can we can open it up next time. But if we go back to the um, back to the slide here, uh, we rotate a around the middle of the torque limiter, and that in this case is the x-axis. So our moment of inertia in the x-axis is 0.86. Um, then in the y and z axes, so rotating around uh, around this way, it's actually less. It's actually only 0.82 to rotate around those axes. Um, there are two reasons for this. Uh, the first one is a the torque limiter uses uh, it's a whole bunch of little little friction pads stacked up next to each other, um, and with those friction pads, the more surface area you have, um, the the more your the more friction you can get out of one plane. So you want to have a higher surface area, um, and at the same time. Uh, the farther away, the bigger your radius is, then the the bigger your moment is, and the bigger that friction, the bigger effect that friction force is going to have. So, right, if we if we had a one really long, if if we could make this torque limiter just ten inches around, then instead of needing instead of needing four little pads in here, we would only need one. Uh, so that's that's the big reason why a, the, our torque limiter has such a large moment of inertia around the axis that we're trying to spin around. Um, what one uh, one thing one advantage to gain or some something to be improved here is to actually reduce that. Uh, so rather than having one rather than having uh, a couple larger or relatively larger friction pads if we could have a whole bunch of them stacked up one uh, one across the other 
um, then it would actually re it would reduce that moment of inertia, and it means we would have more energy back into the powertrain system purely by changing the form factor of the torque limiter. Um, the reason a lot of torque limiters aren't long um, and aren't just made of a bunch of long discs is be just because of packaging. Um, we happen to have in the Baja car, we, we have a lot more space that we could fit uh, a bunch of little clutch pads in. Um, and this, e even still, uh, this is among the smaller of the torque limiters that we looked at, um, partially because it does use four clutch pads instead of just one. Uh, I think the next, the next size up, so this is about four inches in diameter. Um, there's 3.5, I guess. The next size up was like eight inches in diameter. So it wouldn't even have fit under the driver's legs. Um, and that, that one was only, it was literally just two friction pads rubbing against each other, just like that. So, yeah, that's the moment of inertia. Oh. Next time, we can start talking about this, this cool thing called the product of inertia. So I'm going to go ahead and cross this baby. Off. Oh, uh, I'm trying. I'm cross that. Oh, I need a thick line. Big ol' line. Cross that off of our list. Woohoo! Um, there's definitely a lot more to be covered. Uh, a lot more that you could could be learned about the moment of inertia. Um, but that really comes down to tedium. So it comes down to you have a practice problem. You have a shape. You do the math. Figure out the example. You have another practice problem figure out the math, do the example. Um, what we'll do in between here, and I guess I could add a little sub bullet, is the, the parallel axis theorem. 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 There we go. Um, and that, that'll probably take up like half the day uh, next time. But... Um, That'll be kind of in between moments of inertia and products of inertia. Uh, typically, products of inertia is something that you don't learn about until you take intermediate dynamics. But I think it uh, it fits well here, and I think it's good to think about when you're learning the moment of inertia because it I feel like it 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 makes it make more sense. It it helps it stick in your head better. Um, one thing you see here, just as a, a sneak preview. Um, that we actually have nine numbers here talking about mo the moment of inertia. So we've been talking about XX, YY, and ZZ. Our products of inertia are going to be these other ones. So XY, XZ, and YZ. So that's what's coming up next.